As you can tell about the number of videos in this genetics lecture series, there's a lot of detail that goes into this topic and there's a lot that you can learn from genetics. And um, Mendel pretty much stopped at where we are. Now he actually never did those, those kind of problems that we showed on the probability problems, but he did figure out everything we showed on the Mendelian genetic videos. That was all him. And maybe he didn't figure out that meiosis was the cause for many of the things which were happening and that chromosomes were involved in the process and there was genes which were part of this molecule called DNA. But everything that was supposed to happen because of the DNA and the way it works, he figured it out. And he's given credit as being the father of genetics for that reason. Now, the things we're going to talk about now were not actually designed, uh, studied by him, but... Um, these are what we call advanced classical genetics. It's still considered classical genetics because it's not studying chromosomes and anything like that. But these are special genetic relationships, which are also part of, a, of, a, of an advanced version of what Mendel did. So this is what we've learned since Mendel about the way the genes actually work. Now, one of the things we know about is there's actually different versions of the relationships that Mendel was talking about. Now, normally when you actually put a big A with a big A, and a little way with a little way, and you combine those two, and you do a parental cross, you get the Punnett square that you that you see um, um, that has makes hybrids, right? So when you make that hybrid, the let's say big a little way, I told you on the previous videos until now that this hybrid will look dominant. Well, that's not necessarily true. Now, ninety percent of the time, that's true, and it, there will be a dominant gene over the other. But that's not always true. Sometimes, I'm sure you've lived this in your family, mom and dad both speak, speak just as loudly as each other. And therefore, there isn't one that's, that's dominant of the other. It's more like you have something like a big A, and then you have big A version 2.0. Mm -hmm. You know, none of them are technically o over the other. Um, none of them are t really dominant over the other. We call that incomplete dominance. Or when... It, when you combine, you see that here. When you this is an incomplete dominance uh, Mendelian cross pattern. When you when you have a red rose and a white rose, this is not a rose, but it works with roses. That's what roses do. If you have a right ro a red rose, if it's a white rose, and you do a parental cross, you get all hybrids. Remember that, right? And all of these hybrids that you get are going to be pink. And this pink is a new look, a hybrid look. What I said, it doesn't happen. What Mendel said doesn't happen. They look actually blended. Now, that does not mean that the big A and the little a form something like a hybrid of big A, little a and blend it together to form a pink. No. It just means they're both active at once, making it look pink. It's still not blended. It's still particle genetics. They're still going to segregate later. Look at that. So when they segregate, you still have that same scenario when you get, you're going to have uh, um, F1 cross and you're still going to get a, um, the same ratios that you got before. Two are going to be like that, one like this, and then one like this. One is going to be homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two would be hybrids when you do the F1 cross. Except this time, you're going to have the three looks coming back. You're going to have the red look back, the white look back, and you're still going to have the hybrids. So you see the ratios, those genotypic ratios that we did when we did the crosses, all change. In incomplete dominance, you have a 100% new look that looks like neither of the parents on the F1 generation. And on the F2 generation, you don't have a 3 to 1 ratio in looks. Because remember, if this was dominance, these two would actually look red. So you have a 3 to 1 ratio. But since this is incomplete dominance, the, the ratio of phenotype is actually going to be 1 two, one, just like the ratio of genotype. Because the idea is that each genotype has its own uh, phenotype. Instead of this, this, the hybrid genotype being the same thing as the dominant genotype. Now, there is another type, and you see, by the way, a picture of how this looks in real life in an actual flower uh, that, that shows incomplete dominance, right? And so here, you would have uh, something that... Normally, when you have the dominance, this is this here shows you what would normally happen. You would have three purple and one white, but instead you are getting two one to one ratio on the F two generation uh, because of the incomplete dominance. Now, another type of relationship that sometimes happens when genes talk is that instead of creating a blended look, they create a conjoint look, or basically the idea they will create a look where both looks will be present at the same time. 
like something like this, for example. You see here is a codominance. That's when the big A combines with the little A, and it's more like, you know, it's not really a big A or, or little A. It's more like you have two different kinds of genes, and they combine together and they form a new look, which actually looks like both are showing up at the same time. So that's codominance. And you see that in things like different color eyes, different color uh, petals in the same flower, or even human blood types, now, which we're going to talk about in a second. Now, the other thing that, this, that I want to talk about with this is that uh, whether a trait that you're analyzing or a character you're analyzing shows complete dominance, incomplete dominance, or co-dominance, it depends on, on, the, on the actual um, level of analysis that you look at it. For example, there's a disease that's called cystic fibrosis that causes a lot of problems in the, in, in the, in the lungs, you know? Um, and so patients that have cystic fibrosis, and uh, well, they used to die. Now there's a lot of treatment and they can live longer. But basically, if you're like big C, big C, you're fine. You don't have cystic fibrosis. If you're big C, little C, uh, you still don't have cystic fibrosis. But if you have little C, little C, you're probably going to die from cystic fibrosis, which is this disease that causes the accumulation of fluids in the lungs, and eventually you cannot breathe properly. Now, cystic fibrosis is just an example of a trait that is actually more complicated than that. When you look at a face value, at a phenotype that you can actually analyze in terms of the disease, both of these are fine. So these are two are okay. There is no disease as long as you have the dominant gene. The presence of this dominant gene protects you from the disease, and so there is what we call complete dominance, and where you would only have the disease if you actually have the, the, recessive, the homozygous recessive look. That's what we call complete dominance. However, cystic fibrosis is not that simple. If you actually look at cystic fibrosis in the way it actually works, it, does, it actually does something more like incomplete dominance if you actually look at the... At the uh, biochemical level. So if you look at how well the body is performing in general, the metabolic rate of people with cystic fibrosis, um, this type here performs awesome. So he gets an A for performance, A plus, because he has two sets of genes making proteins which are awesome. This one here gets an F. It fails miserably, or even like an F minus, you know, if that exists, because you end up dying if less modern medicine helps you live a little longer. So this one, the metabolism will just fail. Now, on this one in the middle, what actually happens, you're going to get like a C performance. Typic what actually happens is that half of, uh, you, it's like blended. You don't perform as well as this person up here is performing biochemically, metabolically. However, even though you're not performing as well, that does not create sickness, and that's the key. So you see, if you look, analyze the sickness level, these two people are fine, right? But if you analyze the biochemical level, there is a difference between the first and the second genotypes. And so it's more like an incomplete dominance where the second one is a hybrid performance. But that's not actually what happens either. Because if you get even closer and you look at molecular biology and you actually look at what's happening at the molecular level, you actually realize that what's happening is that in this one here, you're going to have the production of, of two good proteins, right? Because you have two genes which are good. But in here, you're going to make a good protein and a bad protein. And in here, you're going to make two bad proteins. So if you were to analyze the blood, you actually realize that there are, or not the blood, the cells that have this protein that causes cystic fibrosis when it's defective, when it has the mutation, you would actually see that someone with cystic fibrosis would have two defective proteins, and that is what's actually causing the bad look, or that causes the death, the, the symptoms. While this person has one protein working fine, but one protein working bad, which is what causes the average performance, but even though you have average performance, because you have one good protein, you're fine. But this one has two good proteins, which what causes the excellent performance. So this actually looks like codominance because you're expressing both looks at once. So what is it? Is it complete dominance, fine versus dead? Is it 
incomplete dominance where you have levels of performance or is it co-dominance when you have double expression of the proteins here? Well, it depends on how close you analyze cystic fibrosis. And that's basically what that is. Now, I didn't have graphics about cystic fibrosis because in a future lecture, we're actually going to talk about what that is. But I just wanted to point out that the actual level of analysis matters if you're trying to decide if this is complete dominance, incomplete dominance, or co-dominance. If you reduce, if you do reductionism and you look at it very closely, it looks to be co-dominance. If you step back a little bit and look at it biochemically, it's, it's incomplete dominance. But at the organism level, it looks like it's actually complete dominance. Now, another thing that's interesting about genetics, and this is another advancement of modern genetics, is the idea that it doesn't quite work the way Mendel said. In Mendel's genetics, you only have two alleles, either you A or you little a. Now, it's true that the little a might be equally dominant as the A, so you get something like a co-dominant situation, where both of them are kind of like uh, speaking, you know, so you have a, a A plus and A zero version. So it could be something like that, uh, codominance. Or it could be something where the big A and the little A are both there and it kind of blend and cause incomplete dominance. But it's always two different versions of the gene with Mendelian genetics. But that's not exactly what happens. In fact, the reason why you have two different versions of some genes is because you, have, you had one mutation of that gene. So basically, you had, originally you had gene A, but maybe later, that, maybe that was the wild type, the one that we named the thing after, but maybe later, uh, gene uh, mutation happened that caused the occurrence of gene little a. The same way cystic fibrosis, you have the normal performing protein which mutated to create the defective gene. So this is a mutation that creates a new look and therefore you have the situation. A lot of human genes are only are unique. You don't have other versions of it. You only have that version. All right. For example, there is um, for most people, there is no such version as no eyes. Everybody has eyes. And so, so you see what I'm saying? Well, there is a multiple millions of traits that are take care of that. But I'm just saying that there's not really a trait for no eyes. Uh, that was a very, very rare anomaly. And most people that have that don't really make it. But either way, they have, probably have more problems than that if they have no eyes. They probably don't really make it as a, a, embryos. So that means that you have the, all of these problems uh, associated with that. But what I want you to understand is that most human traits are not like that. Because who said, let's say one day, a long time ago, you had a gene A for smartness. And everybody was, everybody was, sorry, you have a gene C for smartness. And everybody was averagely smart because of this gene. But then a mutation happened that caused someone to become dumber. So you got a D gene. But then another mutation happened with that gene and made it, made it become even dumber. And then with that gene, maybe a good mutation happened and make it become better and one maybe even better. So who says that you need to have one versus the other or this discrete situation when it's one or the other? You could have, of any g given gene, you can have as many as a billion different types of that gene. For example, for human blood types, there are multiple different aspects to blood types. But one of the factors of blood types is called the, the R RO uh, system, where you actually look at the uh, blood type on the RO system. There are two types of blood types, or, three, or four types of blood types. The type that has no surface proteins in the cell, so the, the one red blood cell has nothing in it, and that's the old, the original blood type, or the wild type. Then, another, a blood type evolved where a surface protein, a glycoprotein, remember from back on the, uh, it's like a protein connected to a carbohydrate, uh, evolved in the surface of this blood thing. And there's a reason why that evolved. We do that in evolution. And this, this blood type became common. Then, at the same time, another mutation happened that created a different one of a B blood type. So now you actually have two, three different versions of this gene. You have a gene that says don't have anything. You have a gene that says, please have A, and you have a gene that says, please have version B of this blood type. Then later on, these blood types can actually combine in what's called a codominant situation where the cell expresses both the A and the B. So this is not actually a mutation. It's more like a codominance where both are merging together and both are becoming present. But what I point is that there's actually three genes associated with blood types. There's gene the dominant gene A, the dominant gene B, and the recessive gene original that's like that. And so the blood types you get is 
of variations of these gene scenarios. You're going to be, so we're going to talk about that on the next topic, but I just wanted to point out that there are some traits, which are human traits, which are multiple allele traits, like the eye color. There are many versions of the alleles for eye color, and that's why you have so many different types of eye color. Well, that's one of the reasons why I have so many different types of eye color. Um, another thing that we have to do in terms of advanced genetics is genetics relationships, and we'll talk about that in another video.